Good morning and welcome to the Heart Snowden Worship Service here on January 16th, 2022. We're grateful you can join us here even through YouTube. And I want to start this morning by reading part of a psalm that I find somewhat timely, <laughs> considering the snow. So let's open our hearts to God, reflecting on where we are in tension and contrast with Him in our lives, and invite Him to come and to heal and to renew as we repent. This is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inmost inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Clean me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Hey kids, I have an idea. So for our kids' message today, why don't we do a little experiential learning? You see, Nehemiah was repairing walls. That's what he's doing in this passage. You guys remember you met him last week. Remember the guy with the name tag that said Nehemiah? So it must have been must have been him. But what I'm getting at is he built walls back. And there's a really fantastic building medium just outside. You may have noticed the snow. Well, why don't Oh, putting it on backwards. Why don't you and your parents after the service go and build something, a wall, a fort out of the snow? and experience a little bit of what it feels like to be a builder like Nehemiah. And just for some frame of reference here, God is like our foundation, right? When we build our lives on him, you guys remember that story about that Jesus told this guy that built his house on sand versus the guy that built his house on a rock. And so as you build, notice, if you build on a nice flat place, that snow's gonna stay better. If you build on uh, something a little wobbly, that snow's got, not going to stay put. That wall's not going to be very strong. So guys, as you build, maybe a little experience, a little Nehemiah for yourself. I mean, look at these mittens. Uh, you can think about God as your firm foundation, the what you build your life on. All right, so go, you know, maybe don't get these on yet because you're going to be a little warm. The service isn't quite over yet, but soon, soon, soon the service will be over. Coax your parents into going outside and playing in the snow. For Jesus. All right, Godspeed. Let's sing together. Search my heart Show me anything that's not like you Show me anything that's not like you Search my heart Show me anything that's not like you Show me anything that's not like you Again Search my heart Show me anything that's not like you Show me anything that's not like you oh. Search my heart Show me anything that's not like you Show me anything that's not like you Shame me with the words you speak Mold me to what call Guide me in your truth For all I want is you Is there I want more? Oh God, I'm all yours There's nothing I want more 
search my heart Show me anything that's not like you Show me anything that's not like you Search my heart Show me anything that's not like you Show me anything that's not like you Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Only there is no one like you There is no
I never am alone. You found me. I never am alone. everybody thanks for being with us this morning it's great to be with you online I wish we were together in person in the high school but this is the next best thing hopefully you are doing well today 
Before I jump into our teaching time together as we continue on with our Nehemiah series, I wanted just to say thank you again to all of you for all of the different ways you participated in our weekend last weekend with Michael and Debbie Sheldon. It was such a good weekend on so many different levels. Michael and Debbie expressed that it was a real gift for them as well. So thank you again for all of your contributions. More details to come in terms of follow up from that weekend, but just wanted to give a big thank you today. We are continuing on, like I said, with Nehemiah. So let's jump right in. Today we are in chapter three. I don't know if you had a chance to read chapter three this week or if you've maybe read it in the past, but I can almost guarantee that if you searched all the Christian bookstores in the US and all the Christian themed Etsy stores and whatever else online, you wouldn't find any inspirational quotes with a beautiful background coming from Nehemiah chapter three. It's kind of a technical chapter. There's a lot of names in there that are hard to pronounce. You'll see a lot of phrases like, next to him, they built this. Next to them, they built this part. And it kind of goes on like that. So it might feel a little bit monotonous maybe a little bit rem reminiscent of other passages like this that we've seen throughout scripture instructions and technical passages like this show up in places like the ark in noah's time or the tabernacle we have a couple of different passages that speak to all the technicalities there but like those other passages this passage today actually has a lot to teach us if we dig just a little bit deeper and i've been pretty convicted this week as I've been studying it and sitting with it a little bit. So I'm ex excited to share some of that today. Let me read just a few verses from the start of Nehemiah chapter three to give us a flavor of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing because of all the reasons I've just mentioned, but let me read the first couple of verses for us. Nehemiah 3 1 says, Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and they rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimuth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshullam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Bana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. And it goes on like this for a number of verses to the end of the chapter. As you probably know by now from different teachings that I've done, I would really love to start out by placing us in the big picture of what is going on before and during and after any given passage that we're in. There's something really exciting about seeing how different parts of scripture fit together, about tracing these sort of sweeping themes or different narrative arcs within scripture and, and tying those in different ways to God's overall redemptive plan for the world. So stick with me for a couple minutes this morning as I do that again, either by way of reminder or, or maybe for the first time for us. As we think about the Israelite people, these people that were chosen to represent God to the world, we can name a few of the highlights of their journey across the generations, right? A couple of different events might come to mind for us. Things like the Exodus, when the Israelite people were brought up out of Egypt and being in slavery in Egypt. We might think of them wandering in the desert for 40 years, maybe the time when they entered into the covenant with God at Mount Sinai, or their entry into the promised land, thinking about Jericho and, Jerusalem, uh, Jericho and Joshua. The near history of the Israelite people, in terms of, of the passage that we're looking at today, the years leading up to that, those included the fall of both the northern and the southern kingdom. So the fall of the ten tribes in the north to the Assyrians, and then many years later, the fall of the southern kingdom, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, to the Babylonians. And that included the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and of the temple, as we've heard about over these last couple of weeks. 
And this began a time of exile for the Israelite people as the majority of them were carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so then today, and, and really throughout this whole series, we're in the period of time immediately following this exile. We're looking together at all that happened as the Israelites began to return from Babylon to Jerusalem. And this return, like we've said, didn't happen all at once. There were a number of different movements of people beginning about 50 to 70 years after the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem. And this corresponds with the promise that was made by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 25. This promise that the exile would not be the end of the story, but that the Israelites would return. And there are three key figures who lead different groups of people back from Babylon to Jerusalem and coordinate rebuilding efforts of different kinds. And we can trace the story of these three leaders through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. They actually used to be together as one book and were separated later on. That's another consideration. But we can trace through Ezra and Nehemiah the story of Zerubbabel and of Ezra and of Nehemiah himself. So firstly, Zerubbabel, who was an Israelite born in Babylon, his name means planted in Babylon. So he represented this generation of Israelites who were born in exile. And he led a large group of people back to rebuild the temple. Firstly, they erected an altar and then later on the full temple. Thereafter came Ezra, who was a Torah scholar in Babylon, and he returned to Jerusalem to teach the Torah and to rebuild the community there. There was a, a relational and spiritual emphasis on his rebuilding efforts. And then finally, there's Nehemiah, who we're considering in this series, who led the rebuilding of the wall around the city. And this should all be a really exciting time for the Israelite people. It should trigger the hopes that been, have been expressed by a number of different prophets leading up to this time. A hope for a future messianic king from Isaiah and Hosea. A hope for God's presence in a new temple from Ezekiel and Zechariah. A hope for God's kingdom to reign over all nations from Isaiah and Zechariah. This hope of God bringing his blessing to all people, which calls to mind his original promise to Abraham in the book of Genesis in the very beginning. And so this really is a thrilling, exciting time. And there are a lot of good things for us to glean from these accounts of the returning exiles from the books of, of Ezra and Nehemiah. And yet, you might have sensed that there was an and yet coming. There's a shadow that hangs over each of these three major efforts, these three major returns. Ways in which the leaders and the people fell short, ways in which their actions and their attitudes didn't fully honor the heart of God, ways in which the same old patterns kept them from fully embracing covenantal life with God. And I want to consider all of that together this morning just for a few minutes, because I think there's so much for us to learn, given where we find ourselves as a church family. So let's focus on chapter 3 for a minute as a starting point, and first consider some of the really great lessons that we can glean from this chapter. Let's start with Nehemiah himself. Michael talked a lot about this last week, so really just by way of review... Nehemiah was overcome when he heard about the state of Jerusalem. The Israelite people had started returning many years before, and yet Jerusalem was still in a state of repair, disrepair. Nehemiah was, was brokenhearted over this situation. He lamented, he fasted, and he prayed. This was a man for whom prayer was central. And the process of him grieving and lamenting, a really important part of his process, let's not skip over it. But moving through that grief and lament allowed him to then step into a place of confidence and of boldness. I love that Mike highlighted last week that Nehemiah was actually asking King Artaxerxes to reverse an order that he'd given years prior for the rebuilding in Jerusalem to stop. I hadn't remembered that part of the story. Nehemiah must have been thought of very highly. He must have been highly respected by the king for him to be able to make 
this kind of request, but it was certainly a bold request. Nehemiah was willing to give up his prestige and his comfort. He was single-minded in his devotion to God and in his goal of rebuilding the wall. He didn't allow himself to be distracted. And we see his effectiveness as a leader in a number of different ways. He held the people accountable for their work. He was effective in the way that he organized them for maximum efficiency. Each family, each person took their part and the work was organized around the gates of the wall, the places that, that were most in need of work. He got every layer of society involved. The high priests were working together side by side with those on the lower ends of society that could only afford a single room to live in. So there's no doubt that Nehemiah was an effective leader and that he was accomplishing something significant. Another important point to note from this chapter is that this work mattered. Israel had been scattered and exiled. Jerusalem had been razed to the ground. The temple was destroyed. It's hard to imagine the level of desperation and devastation and hopelessness that God's people would have felt. But now God's at work to establish his people back in their homeland. And by the time Nehemiah comes along, the temple has already been rebuilt. But Jerusalem would not have been considered a proper city without its wall. The spiritual and political center of Judah needed the protection, needed the sense of order that the wall provided. It also ushered in a, a reordering of society. Many of the gates in the wall corresponded to a particular aspect of society and its proper functioning. So, for example, the, the fish gate nearby the fish market where fish were brought from the Sea of Galilee, the dung gate where refuge, refuse was thrown, the sheep gate where shepherds brought their, their sheep for selling, tied into the sacrificial system. This work mattered. And all of the technical aspects outlined here in chapter 3 are a part of this whole, no matter how small the task. These efforts are all a part of the Israelite people being reestablished and of the city finding order again. This work also represents a partnership between God and his people. God had moved in the heart of the Persian king to allow the Israelite people to return and to rebuild. God is in this work, and as he so often does, he, he dignifies his people and his creation by involving them in his work. Every generation of Israelite people had a unique function to fulfill in the unfolding narrative of God's redemptive work in the world. There's such dignity and value that God bestows on us, his people, when he involves us in his work. And all of these tasks, painstakingly outlined, represented a partnership with God. This effort also required that the Israelite people partner well and cooperate well one with another. Most likely what was accomplished in chapter 3 was a completed lower wall with all of the gates in place and with no gaps. The height of the wall would continue to grow until it was fully complete. Later on in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 6, we're told that the, the completed wall was accomplished in just 52 days, which is incredible. Such a feat couldn't have been accomplished without good leadership and significant cooperation and unity of spirit. Everyone was involved here. Men and women were involved. Different kinds of tradesmen were told about perfume makers and goldsmiths. These are not trained builders, but they're willing to jump in. The high priests got in on the act. They didn't consider themselves too spiritual to get involved with physical labor. They jumped in. And there's no mention of strife among the laborers. We're told a lot in the next couple of chapters about opposition that the builders faced. And, and we'll look at that more closely, but we're not told of any strife amongst themselves. Each was assigned a portion to work on and they worked hard until it was complete. And though there were some holdouts, like the noblemen who refused to get involved, we're told about that in verse 5, but by and large, this was a unified effort that pleased God. 
it brings to mind the truth that all people have a role to play in the kingdom of God and in his redemptive work. So it's easy to see a lot of the good that chapter 3 represents. We've traced some of it. Nehemiah's dedication and his boldness, the significance of the work, the partnership with God, the unity of spirit that is present. And really, I want to just sit back and celebrate that and soak it in, right? But as I mentioned up front, there's a bit of a shadow that hangs over these accomplishments. And the problem is that if we know this story at all, we know that it doesn't take a long time after the rebuilding of the wall is complete for the Israelite people to return to their old rebellious ways and for Nehemiah to lose patience with them. And I don't want to take from anyone who will be teaching on these verses in more detail soon. It's towards the, the end of the book more so. But I do want to try and pull out just one main lesson for us in this tension that exists in the narrative because I think it's so important. The Israelite people under Nehemiah's leadership were part of something truly remarkable. and in, in many ways, it was something that only God could accomplish the restoration of this wall in such a short time. And even prior to that, the restoration of the temple. These things were big and flashy and people took note and they were successes that, that should be celebrated. But like I said, it, it didn't take very long for God's people to lose sight of what mattered most. Despite a, a spiritual revival led by Nehemiah immediately following the completion of the wall where people were weeping and confessing and obeying and rejoicing, it didn't take them long to stray from, to borrow Mike's language from last week, to stray from loving God completely and loving themselves correctly and loving others sacrificially. As is the case so many times before, they have a hard time staying faithful to their covenant with God. The people began neglecting the temple and breaking the commands of the Torah and mistreating one another. It seems like they can't help but repeat the mistakes of their ancestors, even although they had promised not to do so at the completion of the wall. And Nehemiah, for his part, despite all the leadership that he's displayed in rebuilding the wall and then in leading a spiritual revival, he loses his patience. He begins to act violently towards the people. And by the end of the book, he's essentially saying to God, well, at least I tried. I'm throwing my hands up in the air. So what can we learn from this? No doubt God had a blueprint for the tangible and physical rebuilding of the wall. God, or Nehemiah calls them the plans that God put in my heart. But God also had a blueprint for the renovation of their hearts individually and collectively and he has a blueprint for the renovation of our hearts and often this is the much more challenging work right but it is so so worthy of our time and our attention and our effort and there are a number of different examples from the bible of this kind of heart renovation blueprint one of my favorites is in micah 6 8 and i wanted to read that for us it's not the only but i love it this one could be put on an inspirational quote poster. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly and love mercy, to pursue mercy and to walk humbly with God. Despite the many successes involved in this story, there are multiple examples where Israel and her leaders could have acted more justly, where they could have exercised a greater commitment to mercy and a love of mercy, where their pride in achieving so much perhaps got in the way a bit of displaying the kind of humility that represents the heart of God and wins people back to him or into relationship with him for the first time. But in our last couple of minutes, let's take the attention off of the Israelites for a second and maybe put it back on ourselves. We're also in a season of building and rebuilding, right? Maybe we're not putting up any walls 
around Boone, but, but we are focusing on new ministry opportunities and new programs and building our staff and talking about different physical locations that we could inhabit, physical spaces and how they might serve our mission best. And all of these are really good and necessary things. But are we, at every step of this process, are we also committing ourselves to the kind of practices and habits and attitudes that allow us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk in humility? Are we checking back in with God's relational blueprint again and again and again to stop us from drifting? It's easy for us to be attracted to success and to growth, and some of that's okay. But let's be equally committed to the kind of success that can only be recognized in the way that we respond to one another and in the way that we respond to God. Let's invest in relationships that are strong enough to withstand the greatest challenges and the hardest of circumstances as well as the good times. Let's love God completely and ourselves correctly and others sacrificially, believing in our own value and goodness and calling that out in others who are also made by God and for God. I've been wrestling with this a lot personally. I think early on in this transition period, wherever the, the start of that was, it's hard to tell COVID and, and other transitions that we've had, but early on, my own identity was getting way too wrapped up in the success of the heart. Staying up at night and, and frantically thinking through how we could come up with the, the perfect strategy and make sure that we're hiring the perfect people. If I'm honest, I think I was worried that the heart would be seen as a failure and probably even more so worried that I would be seen as a failure. I wasn't present with people in the way that I wanted to be. I wasn't focused on God in the way that I wanted to be. But God brought me back to the truth that this body of believers, this church family, you guys, it's not mine and it's not Ethan's. It's not the ministry leadership teams. It's God's. We are his. And none of us are alone in this. There are so many people in this effort and God is with us. I believe that. And literally in, in the middle of the night a while ago, as I'm trying to just offer all of this to God and, and lay it before them, he met me with a peace that has not left me. I can say that in all honesty. And I still don't know what our future is. I don't know what successes and failures will navigate together. But I know that I'm just that little bit more equipped to be the kind of person that I want to be in the midst of it all. The kind of person who is prioritizing loving God and loving people well, not perfectly, but with intentionality and generosity. And I think if we start to figure out some of those pieces together, God leads us faithfully into the rest. Our fidelity shouldn't be to success for its own sake. Our fidelity is to God. And as we commit to loving God and others well, as we commit to acting justly and loving mercy, really loving it and walking humbly, we can entrust the future to him with absolute confidence that he's with us. I am so excited about all that is being built and rebuilt here at the heart. And I'm even more excited about us becoming the kind of people that God wants us to be in the midst of it all. We have a lot more to learn from Nehemiah. I am excited about where we're headed with this series. I'm excited about just how well it fits with the season that we're in. Let me pray for us and pray for this series. Would you pray with me? God, what an amazing truth that you are with us. You don't give up on us, God. You are faithful. We sang last week about our confidence being your faithfulness, and that is the truth. 
you are faithful to us, God, time and time and time again. And so would we be filled to the brim with confidence and boldness, knowing that that is true? Would we walk forward, believing with our hearts and our minds that you go ahead of us and that we, as a church family, will be able to navigate all that is ahead because you are leading us and guiding us and equipping us. God, would you give us a spirit of unity, one with another? Would you continue to knit our hearts together as a church family? And would you give us your vision for the future that we might just follow in your footsteps? God, as we continue our journey through Nehemiah, would you help us to glean all that we can from the examples set before us? Would you help us just to lean into all that you have for us? God, I pray for this week that you would have your hand upon us, that it would be a week where our church family thrives in, in the different places that we find ourselves until we come back together again, I pray. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. crashing on the shore Steady are your arms living the storm When the desert never seems to end
All right, let's close with our benediction song. I don't want you to sing it as loud as you can. Maybe I can hear you from where I'm at. Maybe we can hear each other in our own homes through the snow. Are you guys ready? All right, let's sing it together. May he be known upon this earth, his saving power among the nations. May he be gracious upon his people, the nations be glad. Shadow for